the audio coming back on. It does tricks on us sometimes. This is half the fun of video broadcasting. My name is Jesse, everyone, and welcome to another thrilling episode of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We are so excited to dive in with 2023. This is just our second week. We've already been to India, the Philippines, across the U.S., Antarctica, just one hour ago, live on a research vessel out there. And I am so excited that you are continuing to join us as we continue our mission of showcasing and celebrating the coolest scientists, explorers, and amazing organizations across this planet. If you haven't checked out our YouTube channel, everything we do goes live there. Uh, we have over 2,500 past broadcasts that you can check out on any topic imaginable. And you can find it about all our upcoming programs, of course, at exploringbytheseat.com. Now today, we are doing something a little bit different. And I will announce what that is after I highlight the fact that we have a code. Because I am so excited, I'm jumping ahead of myself. We are going to have a little game between our Q&A and our talk today. So if you want to play along, four-question quiz, test your understanding, have a little bit of fun, I'll make sure to bring up this pin in just a little bit again as well or after Taylor's talk but if you want to bring up the game pin I'll be putting that in the chat in just a second for everyone too. Now today we are going a little bit afar. We're going to do a topic that we don't usually get the chance to do here at Exploring by the Seed Your Pants and that is Egyptology. I'm a biologist by background and I love all these cool animal interactions that we have the chance to bring you guys but Taylor is a friend of mine. Today she's going to be joining us to talk about her amazing work in Egypt and Sudan to uncover the mysteries and story of one of the most incredible civilizations in the history of the world. One that has really captured the public imagination, whether it's through their writing, hieroglyphs, through their pyramids, these incredible monuments, or through the landscape and incredible history that is, exists along the Nile Valley. So I'm so excited to turn it over to her to blow your minds. Taylor Brian Woodcock, thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here. This is gonna be a lot of fun. If you want to dive in with your presentation, I know you got a lot of stuff to share with us today. Go on and do that, and we all will right. get underway. <laughs> so you can see my slide. We're all I can see. You are cooking with gas. We're all Great. set. <laughs> Great. So I can't see you, but I'm going to imagine your smiling, excited faces as we all get on a plane and fly to Africa, my absolute favorite place in the whole world. And we're going to be making two stops. We're going to go to Egypt and Sudan today and uh, I'm going to show you what is Egyptology like, um, talk about where I work in Sudan, and um, maybe teach you a thing or two about African history that uh, you don't know. There is so much to learn about African history that I've decided I'm going to do that for the rest of my life. So I'll share a few things with you. So as an Egyptologist, um, I live most of the year in Canada, but because I have the coolest job absolutely ever, I get to go every year to Egypt and Sudan, sometimes both of them in a year, um, and I get to crawl around in tombs, and I get to dig in the dirt and find really cool ancient stuff that no one has seen in a thousand years. And honestly, it's such a privilege to have this job. It's a job that a lot of kids dream of having, and uh, I was one of those kids, and I can tell you it is just as fun as it looks. So Africa, Africa is such a huge and diverse place. Um, I think there are a lot more civilizations in Africa than most students get to learn about in school. Um, perhaps you have never heard of the Kingdom of Aksum in now modern day Ethiopia that was an ancient kingdom. Or perhaps you haven't heard of Great Zimbabwe, which is a medieval African kingdom that built a, an amazing stone city. And you can look it up, it's called Great Zimbabwe. It's so cool. Or um, the kingdoms of Ghana and Mali in West Africa that had a sprawling trade network across the Sahara Desert. And these are lesser known kingdoms in, in ancient Africa than Egypt and Sudan, but there's so much to learn about African history. And what I've decided to do for my career is just dedicate my life to Egypt and Sudan, these uh, very dry, very hot Saharan desert countries um, that have thousands of years of fascinating history. They're connected by the Nile. You can see that, that green strip that runs all the way from Khartoum, where the two branches of the Nile meet, and it goes north to the Mediterranean. And that's why we call uh, these civilizations the Nile Valley cultures, because they lived in the Nile Valley. And 
you can probably tell very easily why they lived in the Nile Valley, because the rest of the countries are dry. And if you need to grow your food to live, the desert is not an excellent place to do that. So the Nile was essential for the flourishing of these civilizations in ancient times and in modern times as well. Um, in the ancient world, the Nile was the first highway or maybe slow way. Um, it allowed anyone in any part of Egypt to travel easily to another part of Egypt. This was important for the state to move goods, to move monuments. They put obelisks on boats and uh, traverse them up the Nile to the temple where they, where they established them. Um, and second of all, why it was so important is because every year annually, the Nile flooded. And that brought fresh silt from the Ethiopian highlands that replenished all of the agricultural land which meant that they were able to produce such incredible crops with very, very little work because the Nile was providing a, a constant replenishing of excellent fertile soil. So you probably are familiar with some of the coolest things about ancient Egypt. Maybe you're a fan of the deities, the Egyptian deities. So maybe you've heard of Osiris or Amun or Re, um, or maybe you're a fan of mummification and you think, wow, what a cool thing. And the Egyptians mummified people for thousands of years and they were always experimenting with the mummification process. Um, or maybe when you think of Egypt, you immediately think of the pyramids, which are enormous and staggering to visit in real life. Um, or maybe you know about hieroglyphs and you love that they developed a script um, to write with little owls and little birds and little sandals and lions. And um, if you haven't, I highly recommend that you do a quick Google um, and find the alphabet and learn how to write your own name in hieroglyphs because it's a lot of fun. So these are the most famous things about Egyptology. And there are three ways that we study these things in Egyptology. There are three main branches. The first branch and the biggest branch is archaeology. So this involves excavation. We look for um, all of the leftover things in tombs or in towns or in pyramids uh, or in temples that the ancient people left behind. For example, like this, this bowl of fruit from a dom palm, which is thousands of years old. And the desert, because it's so dry, has preserved them perfectly. Now you definitely can't eat them. They are very dry. Uh, you definitely wouldn't want to eat them. But otherwise, uh, it gives us a glimpse into the kinds of things that they ate and the kinds of things that they put their food in, like this bowl. So the best way to explain um, archaeology is to think about uh, your bedroom or maybe your living room. If someone went into your living room and uh, they found some objects, some of your stuff, maybe they found a musical instrument or maybe they found a pair of shoes. So for example, we have in the first photo, this is a hair comb and it has two little giraffes on top. Or we have some necklaces, cowrie shell uh, that came from the Red Sea. Or we have a sandal. An archaeologist's job is to look at the things that we find and to put together a picture of the way that those people lived based on their objects. So you say, well, they're wearing sandals. They're definitely not going to be living in a cold climate because that's not going to keep your feet very cold uh, if you live in the snow. Um, or um, they wear bracelets. Well, did men wear bracelets or did only women wear bracelets or necklaces? These are questions that we ask to determine how the society functioned and what they believed in and um, how they behaved as a culture. The other uh, major branch of Egyptology is philology. And you may look at this picture and say, well, that's not a language. Um, but in fact, it is. It's made up of little pictures of all of the things in the Egyptian world. These are real birds and real flags and real jars that they used, uh, snakes and parts of the human body and baskets and water. And they took all of these symbols 
and they made them into a language by giving them phonetic value. So we can actually read this. Um, and it's incredibly, incredibly fun. I, in my career, I do a little bit of both. I do a little archeology span and a little philology. So when I'm in the field, I'm an archeologist and I get to excavate. But when I'm in Toronto, I get to uh, teach hieroglyphs at my university. And we sit around and we read hymns and um, poetry and state inscriptions and autobiographies that were written thousands of years ago. And it's, it's far too much fun, really. Someone should probably stop us. We're, we're having way too much fun. The third branch of Egyptology, that, that is the ways that they study uh, the Egyptian culture, is art history. And that's the shape of um, the human body, the clothes that they're wearing. Uh, the color symbolism. Egyptians were very fond of color symbolism, so using red and yellow and orange as solar colors for solar deities, or um, blue for creation deities, or black for rejuvenation um, and rebirth. And you have to remember whenever you see a, a scene like this, which is beautifully carved but has no color, every single scene in a temple or a tomb would have been brightly painted. But over thousands of years, the paint has faded in the sun or it's chipped off and we're left only with the relief. Um, so you have to use your imagination to, to look at the food or the plants or the figures and imagine how brightly colored they would have been. So you probably had seen some things about ancient Egypt before and you're more familiar with mummification or pyramids. Um, but I find that most people don't actually know that much about ancient Sudan. Uh, and these photos represent over 3,000 years of Sudanese history, starting with the Kerma culture into uh, the period where the Kushites actually conquered Egypt and ruled over Egypt from Sudan uh, into the Meroitic kingdom, and then finally into the Balana kingdom with these beautiful silver crowns. But a lot of people have never heard of these ancient Sudanese kingdoms. And just to prove um, maybe how much about ancient Sudan you don't know, here is a little trick question. We automatically associate pyramids with ancient Egypt. Why wouldn't we? They're huge, they're beautiful, they're very stunning. But in fact, if you ask yourself, um, which country has the most pyramids, you might be very surprised to learn that Sudan has more pyramids than Egypt, over twice as many pyramids. In Egypt, there's only around um, 130 pyramids, and Sudan has well over 200, maybe even up to 250 pyramids. They're much smaller pyramids, um, and that's why they were able to build so many of them, because they didn't uh, spend 30 years building a pyramid like the Giza pyramid. They could concentrate on quickly accomplishing one and then moving on to build another one. So speaking of pyramids, here's the site that I work at in Sudan. It's called Jebel Barkal, and it was an immensely important religious site for not just the Sudanese, the ancient, the ancient Kushites, but also for the Egyptians. The Egyptians believed that Jebel Barkal, this mountain, was the home of their god Amun, and that Amun actually lived inside this mountain. He was syncretized uh, with a local deity, and so he took on these uh, Kushite symbols, uh, the symbol of a ram, uh, which is really, really cool to, to be able to study the ways that cultures interact and change each other. So what we're doing at the site uh, is excavating a, a part that's never been excavated before. And I will show you. Uh, but first, have a look at these this re reconstruction of the temples that used to be surrounding uh, the mountain. There were so many temples, and not only temples, but palaces that were built here because the site was so important. Uh, but they were built of very friable Nubian sandstone. So there isn't a lot of them preserved still, unlike in Egypt where they built with limestone, which is much tougher and lasts longer. So you can see the state of the temples, this is pictures from the top of the mountain. Um, and they're still very impressive to walk through, but they would have looked even more stunning when they were new. 
So I'll walk you through, uh, this is our little site. This is called the East Mound of Jebel Barkal. And uh, we're excavating not a, not a, a cemetery um, and not a temple, but it seems to be some sort of a, a settlement with administrative buildings, with bakeries, um, maybe with some domestic areas. And you can see that everything has been made of mud brick. This is probably the foundations of the buildings. The buildings are now gone. So all we're working with are the mud brick foundations. And the site dates to around the first century BC to the first century AD. So what is the process of archaeology? Well, step one, you start moving earth. In the Sahara Desert, that means you're moving lots and lots of sand. You're filling up your buckets of sand. Sometimes you're moving two meters of sand before you get down to the actual uh, archaeological remains. Step two, as you're working, you're very carefully sifting through the sand and you're looking for finds and then you're sorting your finds. So we find beads, we can find um, sometimes preserved papyri, which is a paper, an ancient paper made from a reed plant. Uh, we find lots and lots of pottery, cooking pots, eating pots, offering plates, um, and um, we find little bits of metal that are left over. And then after you've sorted your finds, then you're going to document everything that you found so that you can reconstruct a picture of what life was like in that space. Oh, and then the fourth step is if you find something really cool and if you happen to work with a really excellent team like I do, then you win a chocolate or a sausage. So here's a sausage that I won for finding our first uh, shard with a Meroitic inscription on it. That was a really, really fun day. Um, inscriptions can tell us uh, a lot about a site's usage um, even more so maybe than the pots themselves, although a ceramicist would definitely agree with me on, uh, disagree with me on that. Um, so here, hopefully this video will give you a little glimpse into what it's like to do archaeology in the Sahara Desert. There are days when we have sandstorms and um, there's more sand coming into the trench than you are taking out of the trench and that can be a very disheartening experience. Um, but what we're working with are um, basically carpentry tools. We're working with trowels and brushes and little dustpans or buckets and baskets. And you take your trowel and you scrape away just a little bit at a, at a time. And then you take your brush and you try to find out what's under there. And you're looking for features. You're looking for doorways or walls or hearths. If you find charcoal, then you're dealing with a, a space where some cooking was done in an ancient time and you quickly get your notebook and you write that down. Um, and so to, to take you back to um, the idea of looking at your own living room or your own bedroom and saying, what kind of person, what does this say about me from these objects that we find? Here's the space that I worked in last season. And it's a room, a very clearly demarcated room. And inside of it, we had six really large pots. And it was very quickly uh, apparent that these were cooking installations. They have lots of charcoal and inside, they have bone, they have little bits of ancient bone from the last meals that were cooked inside these pots. Um, and they have little seeds. And so what we do is we take all of the soil that are inside the pots out and we bag them. And then we do a process called flotation where everything that's not dirt, like little seeds um, are going to float. And then we can analyze them and find out exactly what they were eating in these pots. So sometimes, you're going to find other things inside these pots. You're going to find charcoal and bones and little bits of cooked things. Um, but we had a really fun moment last season where we found inside this large cracked and broken cooking pot, we found a perfectly preserved little bowl and it was the first um, unbroken bowl or, or vessel of any kind that we'd found at the site. It was put inside this cooking jar and um, it looks like it could have been made yesterday, but really it's 2000 years old and very charming. It was, a good, it was a good day. I think I won a chocolate for that one. 
So I want to leave you with um, a little, uh, one of my favorite fun facts about studying Egyptology and why it's so important to study ancient um, history, because we think, well, they lived so very long ago. What relevance do they have to our lives? But I bet that you didn't know you speak some ancient Egyptian. Our word for gum or gummy candies, if you go to the store and you want to buy a stick of gum or you want to buy some gummy bears, our word gum comes from the ancient Egyptian word kemet. So it went through um, Egyptian into Coptic and then into Greek and into Latin and finally into English um, as gum from kemet. So now you've learned that you actually know a little bit of ancient Egyptian. And to give you another example of ways that history is still uh, being practiced, old ancient historical uh, behaviors are being practiced today. This is a scene from an Egyptian papyrus and it has a headrest sitting on this pedestal. And um, this, this papyrus is, you know, 2,500 years old. But if you go to parts of East Africa, you will find wooden headdress being made in exactly the same way that the Egyptians made headdress. Um, and that's why this is one of my favorite quotes by William Faulkner. The past is never dead. It's not even past. We can constantly find ways that the ancient world is still uh, being practiced today if we give us the chance to study them. And that oh. is me. Taylor, My exploration of Egypt and Sudan. That was spectacular. What a great journey we got the chance to go on. You highlighted so many links and resources that I've been sharing relentlessly in the chat over the last few minutes. And if you want to come out of screen share so you can see us again, please do. We can have a bit of a conversation. I'll bring you back in just a second. Uh, we are going to start with our Kahoot, see how much you are paying attention, have a little bit of fun. Uh, for those who haven't played Kahoot before, the faster you answer, the more points you get. Now, you don't win anything, but you will win Taylor and I's everlasting respect if you end up number one in this, okay? So I'm going to cue this up for everyone. We are going to get underway. Quite a few of you are already in, which is great. Um, we're going to give you a few more seconds to get in, and then we are going to dive in and get underway. It's good to know for me that next time I'm eating like a pile of gummy bears and I'm feeling kind of like not the best about myself, that I can be like, well, I'm I'm practicing Egyptology to a degree, or so I can I can finagle that. There's some finesse that I'll tell my wife. Um, Many of you are already in. This is great. We've got all these great names. I'm kind of hoping that we have a name that's vaguely Egyptian, like we got like a camel or something is going to win this. Uh, but we'll see how it goes with our, our animal names here. I'm going to start us underway. 45 of you are already in. That's amazing. Let's get underway with our first question. Taylor, you can give them little hints when there's a few seconds to go, and I might ask you to explain stuff at the end of each question. But here we go. Three, two, one. Dive in. And then, Mr. Hancock, you're going to be our first question live. Egyptology is comprised of which of these disciplines? We talked about a few today. Archaeology, philology, art history, or maybe, because it's something that I like to add a lot, all of the above. What do we think? Hmm. I, you know, it's funny. Archaeology, we get the chance to talk about a few times here. Philology, I think that's the first time that that word has ever been mentioned in the history of exploring. Oh, Thank you. Most of you got this right. All of you have archaeologists yeah, where some of you instinctually went, which is is great. It's that they all sort of coalesce together with the study of Egyptology, and I'm sure you can get more disciplines thrown in there if you. It's not even a stretch to say that there's a lot that goes into trying to understand a civilization that was around for a very very long time. All right, let's see our leaderboard, Taylor. So joyful echidna, very much not an Egyptian or Sudanese animal, is number one. Uh, we're going to go to number two. True or false? Ancient Egyptian civilization thrived for only about a hundred years. It was amazing. They built all these pyramids. They had this pantheon of gods, but it was pretty short. It was like, you mm. know, 1920s to now. What do we think? Mm. Mm. I'm hoping most of you get this right, because we did talk about some of the traditions here passed along. We talked about some of the technologies that are still in use long after. Almost 70 of you have answered. Yep, there we go. And our answer, of course, is... False. So it's how long has ancient Egyptian civilization been around? Like more or less? Was it thousands? Five thousand years? years. Yeah. And I mean, to contrast that, because it's really hard to, that's a big number. You know, we've had uh, science and technology and sort of this modern quote unquote civilization for a few hundred years, maybe 300 could be argued. 
And you have ancient Egyptian civilization that lasted for so, so much longer comparatively and speaks to the, the level of expertise over the environment, of the cultural traditions being, you know, very effective in, in that area and, and so much more. So I'm really glad we got that question. Clever Panther takes our lead. Okay, we're getting somewhere, folks. We got another quiz for you. Artifacts at historical sites should be handled by trained professionals or anyone who gets there first. If you show up at Jebel Bargle, and you want to like grab some stuff, you can do that and just walk away and take it home and then show your friends. Is that a good idea? Taylor, what do we think? Ooh, I don't know. Well, <laughs> 73 answers. We hope that most people know that it is trained professionals. Yes. Yeah. So in the past, I mean, and in many cases, a lot of the sites that, uh, you know, geez, the Grand Pyramids, which a lot of people will be familiar with, were looted. People came and took away the stuff and we have no... We don't know where that stuff is. We don't really, know. all of ancient Egypt and ancient Sudan, they've been looted almost immediately. So there's not a point in time um, where things are just left alone. There, there was even a problem in ancient times with people yeah. breaking into kings, you know, pharaohs' tombs and taking things. So they posted guards often. Yeah. So it, it's really important to have people like Taylor who know what they're doing, who can go in and put that stuff in a historical context so we can build up these incredible stories that we're able to share with you guys about these civilizations. And, and so I'm really glad most of you are on the ball with that. We're going to take that positive note into our final question together. Approximately how many pyramids can you find in Egypt and Sudan combined? I wanted to mess with you guys a little bit. Is it 10? Ooh. Is it 100? 350? 10,000? There's just pyramids everywhere. That's what do you think? Okay, weeny, meeny, miny, mo. Nine more seconds, and then we're going to head for our questions. YouTubers, you can share questions in the chat as well. We'd love to hear from you. 75 answers. So many of you in Kahoot today. I love it. Uh, come on in, and yes, most of you got this right. right. Way to go. Um, okay, Taylor, here comes our leaderboard, our finale leaderboard. If you are any of these students, let us know, because we want to bestow upon you that everlasting respect that we promised. Clever Panthers, number three, Joyful Echidna. Wow, two of our early leaders. And number one, drum roll, please. Awesome octopus. Very, very, wow. uh, <laughs> not, not so sandy, but a great name. Way to go, guys. You guys are awesome. Um, I'm going to head to Mr. Hancock's class in Georgetown, Ontario. If you guys want to kick us off with a question, come on in. Hey. Hey, hey, Taylor. Hey, Justin. Just sitting next to an amazing octopus over here. Came first in the Nice. <laughs> Um, so we had a couple questions, Taylor, uh, wondering about some of the things you found. You shared with us a few of them. We're curious, um, are any of them, were you confused? Did you think it was one thing and then it turned out to be something else? Is there oh, absolutely. oh, absolutely. You're always finding, um, especially with, with settlement sites, um, if you think about if people packed up and left your neighborhood and moved, they decided they wanted to live in a new city. They moved slowly over a few years or maybe over a generation. They're going to take all of the good stuff with them. They are not going to leave grandma's favorite cabinet or rocking chair. Um, they are only going to leave broken bits of things that they aren't going to use anymore, which means you're constantly finding little tiny bits of things and you have to go, what on earth could that possibly be? And you take it back and sometimes you don't know and you, you're passing it around and everyone's tr tr racking your brain and trying to think, what, what, what could this be? And it's usually because it's very broken and it's very old and it's been beaten around in the sand for a few thousand years. And eventually you go, oh, it's a little piece of a little something else, but you only have this much left of it. I love that you found an entire bowl. I mean, you, you shared your excitement of that story. And I've never seen someone quite so dirty in a picture, by the way. So well done. <laughs> you're very muddy as you're excavating this. But like, what an incredible find. Like, that's got to be such a rare thing in any archaeological site. But just what, you know... The thing with archaeology in general is that you're the first person to handle something like that in thousands of years. Yeah, And that's a really special, there's a lot of responsibility associated with that, but what an incredible opportunity every time you get to go to work. Like what a And, and typically, because the, no one has seen them in a few thousand years, they're also very, very fragile. So yeah. in this case, to have a beautiful, unbroken, unblemished, brand new, essentially, vessel uh, that had been protected by a bigger, mm -hmm. broken pot uh, and was just, just, brand new um, was was really, really fun. 
I even the fact you were holding it, like I, I, I don't know. I couldn't do that. I would touch it if someone else was holding it, but I feel really. Let me tell you, to walk it from site back to the dig house, I was, I was so careful. Was like, we're not gonna break this after thousands of years. <laughs> like, like a newborn baby. Um, Miss <laughs> D's class. I know you guys are just audio, but you should be able to come on in and share a question if you have one for us. You're. In Can you hear us? Class. Yeah, you're good to go. Turn your volume off. Oh, that's it. Can you hear us? Yeah, 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 you're good, Misty. Okay, Taylor, I'm wondering what is your education to do your job? And if there's are jobs within your field that require less education? Cool. Um, great question. So I, I'm currently doing my PhD at the University of Toronto. I did a bachelor's in history and art history, and then I did a master's degree in Egyptology specifically. And I'm not, now I'm doing my PhD in Egyptology. Um, it's not, it's not required to have a PhD to go that far, especially if you're going to go the archaeology route. If you're going to be a philologist, you will typically need a PhD to do this job. But if you just want to do archaeology and dig in the dirt, um, then you you need much less, maybe even uh, simply a bachelor's degree. And I always like to highlight too, when it comes to exploration and science, that if you don't have the acumen if you don't have the interest in diving in and going to school for that period of time there are so many jobs out there maybe you want to work in a museum and you're around the artifacts that come in maybe you're a technician that gets to help process that when it gets in maybe you're a person who's in business that wants to help finance expeditions to these places maybe you're an artist that wants to draw some of the findings from the field and so whether you're, you know, you're, if you want to get involved like Taylor did and spend a huge amount of time after high school getting involved and heavily mm -hmm. engaged with this and working with scientists, great. Um, but so many opportunities out there, which is a great question, Miss D. All right, we're going to go to Frozen, <laughs> South Lake Tahoe. Miss Rice's combo class, if you want to unmute your mic uh, and uh, dig out from the snow, uh, you are good to go to ask a question. Hey. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so my class is over here in a Google Meets, and I have a question from um, Zaria. I don't know if you can hear her or not, but I'm going to let her say her question. Zaria? Okay. Zaria, you want to unmute and ask your question, or you want me to ask it for you? Okay, her question is in here. How, oops, sorry, I'm unmuted. Okay, so uh, here we go, Google Meets. Uh, Zaria, you wanna go ahead and ask your question? Guess what, I was muted. Okay. Still not I don't know if you can hear her. How long does it take to usually find something? Is it right away? Is it days, yeah. weeks into oh, it? Oh, wow. That is, I have to say, the most fun part because some days you will not find anything at all and you are quite tired from digging and not finding anything. Um, so it really depends. It depends on the site. It depends on um, how much traffic <clears throat> the site has had over thousands of years. If uh, there were always people living at the site since the site uh, was built in ancient times, then <clears throat> it's going to be a little bit more picked over. So there are days you find nothing. There are weeks you find nothing. and uh, But then you find a complete bowl and it was all worth it. Yeah. I love that this is the case for pretty much every scientific discipline. We have a lot of wildlife filmmakers on here and people say, hey, do you get like a National Geographic shot every day? And it's like, no, you sit in a hide for three weeks and you're frozen. You're almost as cold as it is in South Lake Tahoe. And then you finally get your picture of the snow leopard and it's amazing. So I'm really glad we got that question, guys. Miss Wafer, I'm going to head to our Laurel Springs School with students internationally. And then I will note for our YouTube groups, if you want to share in the chat, please do. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, Miss Fortin Koga's class, if you guys want to share in an email, if it's giving you trouble on YouTube, please do send me stuff there and I'll pass it along to Taylor. But Miss Wafer, come on in. Hey. Hi. So great to be here. And um, as Jesse said, we have students all over the world. I have them in a Zoom room and I do have a couple of questions from our upper school students. So. Claire is from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, and she wants to know what is the process to identifying how old an object is or historical piece? And then um, River Lee, also in ninth grade from Atlanta, wanted to know what is the oldest thing that you've found? Um, wow, what? those are great questions. So for... Um, for determining how old an object is. There are a lot of different ways that we do that. In Egyptology specifically, we use uh, quite a bit of typologies. So what that means is that over the years, we've found 
lots and lots and lots of kinds of pots. We have so many pots um, from so many different sites from so many different eras that we've been able to create a timeline, essentially, of pots. And we know roughly uh, this kind of pot comes from this time period, and then it changed a little bit and it turned into this kind of pot, and then it changed a little bit and turned into this kind of pot, and then they decided they didn't want pots anymore or they just want to use plates. Um, and so what we have is kind of a, a, a typology system where we can find something, we can go back into our, our literature, and we can go, oh, we have found this kind of pot at these sites, and these sites are dated to this these periods. Um, so we do a lot of that. Um, also, another helpful way of dating things in archaeology is stratigraphy, which is a very simple law. That means the further down you go, the older you get. So if you have some pots at the beginning, the top layer, and then you go down another meter and you have other pots, those pots are older. That's going to help inform your typology. You know those pots must be older. Maybe you don't know yet how much older they are, but you know they must be. You do that at enough sites, and eventually you'll create a very helpful timeline for dating things. That is a great answer. Is there an oldest thing that you've ever found? Oldest thing I ever found. Um, when I was working in Egypt, we found a, a, a beehive that was inside a, a pot. And the honeycomb, of course, it's totally dry because it's the Sahara Desert, but the honeycomb was still inside this man-made ceramic uh, beehive. And that was quite a bit older than, than anything that we found in Sudan. And so, uh, yeah, very fun. Very unexpected answer, but I absolutely love it. And by the way, on the uh, finding pots various ages, I think back to like pictures of my house when I grew up as a child, where it was the 90s, but it looked like the 50s because my family hadn't seen it. So if you see yes. pictures of maybe your parents' property or grandparents where they lived, you can very easily tell from the furniture and the decor what era it's from because people change and fashions change over time. Absolutely. You can do typologies with everything from iPhones to computers to keyboards to books, books are made differently, to uh, tombstones. If you walk around a cemetery, you can tell based on style, based on material, what things are older. Yeah, this is a great lesson for everyone. I'm so glad we got that in. Um, I'm gonna add to YouTube because we got a great question on YouTube. And then I want us all to give a round of applause to Taylor, but she is our first scientist of 2023 to actually have a speedy enough presentation that we can get multiple rounds of questions. So thank you, <laughs> thank you, this is my favorite thing. Um, Jordan wants to know, are all pyramids tombs? With Sudan having so many pyramids, I'm curious what they all contain, which is a great question. They are tombs. Yes, they are all tombs. Um, now, the difference is if you make a big enough pyramid, so the Egyptian pyramids are very, very large. The biggest ones took 30 years to build. You will put the burial chamber actually inside the pyramid itself. But if you build a very, very small pyramid, which is only going to take you a couple years, um, there isn't room to put the burial chamber inside the pyramid itself, so the burial chamber is going to be located below the pyramid. But yes, all very tombs. Cool. Very, very cool. Well, speaking of tombs, okay, so Miss Fortinkoga's class, and again, welcome in. I'm sorry that the tech's not working for you to be with us live, but they wanted to know if you've ever found anything really big, like a tomb. You're just, you're just walking around the desert and something it's like, pyramid! Like, has that ever happened to you, or what's the biggest thing you found? Now, I... Uh, I, I have never found a pyramid, uh, although that, that does actually happen. People still do find pyramids. Um, but you can, I think you would be very surprised how often you can find entire tombs, still multi-room tombs that you didn't even know was there because they just look like the regular ground level. And then you're clearing away and suddenly you go, wait a second, there's some steps here. Oh, where do the steps go? Oh, they're going down. Oh my gosh, we have a completely different tomb, which does actually happen quite often. That would be, I mean, again, something in paleontology, I grew up with that as an idea that you crack open a rock and find a fossil that no one's ever seen. But like you're walking along a desert, you're in a site, and then you find the entrance to a tomb. Like that is just, it, it's, it stirs the soul. Like it's amazing, exciting. But I have seen it happen. Yeah. Um, we're going to go back in live with all our classes uh, one more time. Mr. Hancock, if you want to come on in for a question, you are good to go. Yeah, we had a few students curious about uh, where your passion began for Egyptology. Oh, yeah, I love this. I love this question. So I, um, I actually, I'm from the states. I was born in the U.S., but I grew up in East Africa. 
So I grew up in Kenya, uh, which means that I got to do a lot more exploring of African countries than most people do if you grow up in the States or in Europe. Um, so my dad took me to Egypt when I was a teenager just for fun. It's very close to Kenya. It's an easy trip to make. And um, I saw the pyramids and the temples and hieroglyphs. And I said, this is the coolest thing I can ever possibly imagine doing with my life. And I was hooked. That is a beautiful answer. And it speaks to something that we've been hearing from all sorts of scientists over the last couple of weeks. You know, get those experiences, whether it's close to home, if you have the opportunity to go somewhere like Egypt, of course, it's a very special part of the world and you get the chance to have this wow factor. But wherever you live, whatever your circumstances, whether it's reading, whether it's going out and exploring, whether it's talking with scientists, most people are really keen to share their work. And those experiences early in life can really change how you live your life. I mean, they, they, Obviously, it's prompted something very exciting in, in you, and uh, I'm so glad you're taking the time to share it with us today. Let's head back to Ms. D's class. You are good to go. We can hear you again, so you're all set if you have a second question. Hey. Can you ask me? What does mummification mean? Ooh, good question. Mummification is the preservation of a body, and that could be a human body, or an animal. They mummified animals, so they mummified cats and dogs and bulls and even lions. Um, mummification is a process by which you take out all the moisture of the body so that it stays preserved just the way it is, which means you can find them in tombs thousands of years later and, and they still look like real people because they haven't decomposed. They're just a little shriveled like a raisin. It's I, we got, um, you guys are in St. Thomas, so you're not too, too far away in three from the Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, just a spectacular place if you want to see an incredible world-class Egyptology gallery, um, a place that I went many, many times as a kid. Uh, and I've just put in the chat for everyone too, how to make a mummy, uh, not Geo Kids uh, discovery things. If you want to learn a little bit more about that, because I, I know we could talk about mummies all day long, probably. Um, I'm amazed at the first question we got on them, frankly. Miss Rice, I'm coming back to Senate Lake Tahoe. Miss Wafer will wrap up with you in a minute. Time flies and you're having fun. So we are nearing the end of our broadcast, but come on back in and uh, take us away. Hey. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, go ahead, uh, Coral, you have a question? It wants to work. It's thinking about it. Okay, you can't hear her. So no, she wants to know, I've got my class here on a Google Meet. She wants to know what is the oldest place that you have ever excavated? Ooh. Oh, the oldest place ever excavated. I, um, I excavated in some tombs in Egypt and they were from around 600 BC. Yeah. And that is the oldest place. Very, very cool. Thanks, Ms. Rice's class. I'm sorry the text giving you a few troubles, but this is half the fun. Something should go wrong in every video broadcast. Otherwise, are you in one? Uh, Ms. Wafer's class, I'm coming to you guys next uh, to wrap us up with one final question after that, but join us at Laurel Springs. Hey. Awesome. We always like to ask about inspiration, but that's already been asked. So we thought we might ask about your future. What do you hope to find in the future? Or maybe what do you hope uh, to see in your profession or uh, accomplishments that you uh, personally hope to accomplish in the future, looking ahead. Nice. Um, I, you know, I have wanted to work in Sudan since I was 16 years old, and oh. I finally got to do that for the first time in, in 2019. And if I can continue to go work there every year for the rest of my life, I think I would die a very, very happy person. Um, it's one of those one of those times where you had a dream and you get to do it and it didn't disappoint at all. So if I get to do that and keep teaching hieroglyphs, that's it. That's all I need. It's always nice uh, when we have people that are as passionate as you are, because I get to say to kids, if you're keen on Egyptology, if you want to follow in Taylor's footsteps, fantastic. But if you can find something in your life that you are happy doing for the rest of your life and has surpassed every expectation, you absolutely adore doing it, whatever that may be, whether it's art or science or history or who knows what, uh, that's a really special place to be. And I'm, I'm so happy for you. And and thanks for, for sharing. The that world would be a better place if we all loved our jobs as much as Jesse and I do. Yes, we're very, we, we pinch ourselves daily. And, this, and teachers are pointing themselves too. Everyone loves it. This is a good, this, this is the fun of exploring by the seat of your pants. Um, 
Taylor, before we wrap up, is there any final message you want to share with kids on places they can go to learn more about the work that you do, uh, about Egyptology in general, anything to inspire them uh, to after the broadcast is done? I will say that very likely, no matter where you are located in the world, you have a museum close by that has Egyptology stuff in it, that has mummies, that has pots and weapons and clothes and tons of ancient stuff. And if you haven't seen them, if you haven't accidentally stumbled upon them in a museum, um, go find one because it's incredible and incredibly humbling um, to go and see the way people have lived thousands of years before and to find things that we can relate to in those people. And I think that's why we should study history because it teaches us empathy for cultures um, and empathy for ourselves and difference and um, the beautiful diversity of the world. So go to a museum. Taylor, it couldn't be a better message to wrap up than that. Uh, I want to stress, if you want to learn more about Taylor's work, if you want to read some of the stuff that she's written, some really great articles here on the link below, and I'll make sure all our classes have that. If you want to find out about Jebel Barkle a little bit more, we've got this slightly unwieldy URL, but a lot of fun to check out, and I will send that in an email as well to everyone. Thank you so much live to our YouTube audience classes from all over the world today. We really appreciate you joining us. And Taylor, since it's your first time, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our teacher friends to say a big thank you and farewell. So Mr. Hancock's class, Miss D's class, Miss Rice, Miss Wafer, thank you so much. Everybody. We can say thank you. Wonderful day, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.